Welcome to the 211 Tampa Bay Caregiving Series. My name is Monica Stinchula, and I'm a social worker, business owner, and family caregiver for my mother who lives 900 miles away. I, along with my siblings and mother, cared for our father who died a decade ago. Dad's cancer journey and death led me to shift my career to addressing the demands facing family caregivers. It is my pleasure to lead this discussion on who are family caregivers. I believe we caregivers are personal assistants and leaders at the same time. Many of you assist with activities of daily living, such as brushing, bathing, dressing, toileting, bringing purpose and dignity at whatever level of care is needed. Some days and in some situations, this means organizing and directing others, but for some, this means hands-on daily personal care. On average, family caregivers report spending 24 hours a week on care activities. Caregivers also do household tasks like cooking, cleaning, laundry, shopping, and paying bills. In my opinion, a caregiver is a personal advocate with the healthcare team and the insurance company to make certain that the right medicine and treatment happen at the right time and place. Caregivers are advocates. Caregivers protect and ensure a life of dignity for vulnerable people. People who grow up in multi-generational families may not agree that the tasks they are doing are caregiving. In fact, in some cultures, it's caring for your elders is, a, is an obligation, a blessing. Whereas in other cultures, we believe that independence and privacy deter us from getting involved in another person's life. In fact, a caregiver may be a trusted friend and not a family member at all. Caregivers are all of us. Parenting a parent is difficult for everyone. Many parents resist support, shun the adult child's offer, ignore their advice, and often suffer decline as a result. Bookstores are filled with self-help books about what to expect when your kid is, well, fill in the blank, first grade, second grade, whatever. But there aren't books like that when it comes to caregiving. Well, these books don't exist because our aging changes are not so neatly staged as it is when we're a child. Our needs are based on where we live, our chronic conditions, what kind of acute illnesses we may be suffering at the time, and if we have any support around us to help us to be able to age in place. Our decades of life are like rings on a tree, which makes some of us strong and able to withstand disease and disaster, and others of us, unfortunately, will need help along the way. So let's take a close look at some of the daily activities and strategies for managing them. We all start our day with a routine, right? Toileting is the highest priority for maintaining independence and dignity. So let's discuss this daily activity first. How can you set this task up for success? I recommend elastic waist pull-on pants and a pull-on underwear are the best options. So making that action of dressing and undressing as easy as possible. The next step is transferring from standing to whatever position you're going to be toileting in. You know, there are adjustable toilet rails, raised toilet seats, armrests, all these different devices, including grab bars, that you can position around a toilet to reduce the risk of falling. The next task is cleaning up. Attachable bidets are great, and so is using a peri bottle like this one here. Be certain that the water is not too hot or too cold, that it startles or injures very sensitive skin. A toilet paper wand is great, and so are long-handled um, toilet tongs that you can purchase. They help to extend the reach to be able to get into those hard to reach places, those areas between the legs. Next, let's talk about dressing and grooming. Dressing and grooming starts the day before you wanna get dressed. It starts with arranging the clothes that you're going to wear, right? So 
I recommend that you rearrange closets and drawers so that the easiest to wear clothing are on top. Resist that urge to dictate what clothing choices a person has to do. Unless you wear a uniform, no one wants to be told how to dress. You can create your own easy grip tools. Let's do it now. So, here's a manual toothbrush, right? Regular toothbrush. I can turn this toothbrush into an easy grip brush by inserting it into foam. And now someone who has a problem, a weak grip, arthritis, problems with their hands, can now grip that toothbrush. And this is washable. I purchased this tubing online and it's very easy to order and have delivered to home. You'll also find it in craft stores. Look how easy it was to make this into an easy grip tool. I did the same with the hairbrush as well. You see how easy this is to use now? So that takes care of brushing. How about dressing? You know, zippers can be really hard. Think of it. A zipper requires fine motor skills to pull, to hold onto the tongue of the zipper and pull it up, right? Take these hair ties, just like this, loop it through a zipper, and now you have a zipper extension that you can either put a finger through and pull it up, or you can grab hold of it. Little changes like this make all the difference between having independence addressing and needing that assistance. One other trick I want to show you is about buttons. We all like our shirts that button up the front, right? We want to be able to wear buttons. I have a trick for you. It's called Velcro. You can take the button and sew the button permanently to the front of the shirt as if it's already through the hole. And then on the back side, put a little piece of Velcro. Now you have a Velcro garment, but it looks just like the button up garment that you like. Think about these changes. Think about ways that you can make dressing, grooming so much easier and independent. Next, let's talk about eating. Do not forget about supplemental nutrition programs that you can find using 211 Tampa Bay Cares. Also, Meals on Wheels programs vary by provider. I know some that only use local produce, not frozen meals. Please contact 211 Tampa Bay Cares for more information. So, just like we did with brushing, we can turn normal utensils into good grip utensils, just like that. Now let's go on to medication. Doctors prescribe medication, pharmacists dispense medication, but it's you, the caregiver, that is responsible for carrying out their plans. If pills are too large to swallow, if it's too difficult to administer, like an injection, or if it's making the person ill, you need to notify the doctor or the pharmacist immediately. Please don't stop the medicine and wait till the next scheduled appointment. A pill box or an automatic pill dispenser is a great way to keep track of the medicine that is being taken as prescribed. Appoint one responsible person to assist with all medication use. Take pictures of the medication bottles with your smartphone. Arrange for a pharmacist consultation to review all medications, both those prescribed and those you're getting over the counter. Demand that a medication reconciliation be done in the doctor's office and at the time of a hospital discharge. Have you met Alexa, Siri, or hey Google? Here is Alexa. We have her here with us today. She lives in this little device called a voice-enabled technology. Let me show you two ways that Alexa can help caregivers. I will show you how to do reminders and routines. So, here we go. Alexa, set up a reminder. What's the reminder for? To drink water. When should I remind you? Every two hours. At what time would you like the first reminder? At 4.47. Is that in the morning or in the afternoon? In the afternoon. That would mean late night reminders between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Is that okay? No. Okay, 
I'll remind you every two hours. You can create these easy reminders and routines using the app on your smartphone. Now, that was a reminder. A routine requires that you go into the app on your phone and it will ask you questions. We have them for you, but it will ask you questions to take you directly through so you can set up a routine. So you could set up a morning routine. And the morning routine can be, Alexa, wake me up at 8 a.m. And you can build on that routine and you can say, remind me to brush my teeth, wash my face, use the toilet. Remember, we're talking about people who may wake up in the morning and not remember what to do first. Technology is there to enhance what you're doing. Technology is there to help you. These devices are inexpensive and easy to use. This is a reminder to drink water. Thank you, Alexa. So don't forget about reminders and routines. They're easy to use and you can do it on there. You can also do it on devices like this. It's an Alexa device, but it has a screen on it. So it will light up and it will give you the information so that you can read it as well as hear it. So these devices are great. They're great for caregivers to set up those daily routines. We need to tackle home safety for caregivers and for seniors. 95% of senior adults say they want to stay in their home as they age. So the first topic that we're going to cover today is fall prevention. Okay, falls are scary especially as we age. The good news is there are things you can do in your home to reduce the threat of falling and the impact if you do fall. So I have a series of questions that we need to talk about. So these are general questions of things you need to do for safety in your home. First of all, are the rugs firmly attached to the floor? Are the floors free of tripping hazards? We need to get those off. Next, do the lamps and ceiling lights work? Is there adequate lighting to light every area of a room? Is the outdoor lighting adequate to see at least 10 feet from the house? I believe our need to feel secure changes with our abilities and age. And technology can help us to do that, to stay connected and feel safe. Installing a home safety system and fall detection system will give you the confidence you need and give your family and friends the peace of mind they need. There are many ways to make your home safe. Let's start with securing the doors and windows. Please check to make sure the doors and windows lock. Install motion sensor lights and in outdoor areas, make sure that motion sensor lights are there to light up any object that moves. Let's talk about bathroom safety. Did you know that most falls and injuries at home happen in the bathroom? I mean, think about it. Bathrooms are dangerous places. Since there are smooth floors and, and slippery tubs once everything gets wet, it's also important to make sure that the bathroom is accessible for everyone in the household. And that a phone or an emergency contact device is available there in the bathroom. I have a great security checklist for you that we're going to go through. In addition, we have some products that you will need to make sure that your bathroom is safe. So let's get started. First, bathroom rugs need to be secured to the floor. So you can use a double-sided tape in order to secure them to the floor. And like every other room in the house, the bathroom floor needs to be free of clutter. Is the sink secured to the wall? Check it. Take hold of the sink and make sure that it is. Is there a railing or a grab bar near the sink? And by that I mean either a chrome or fixed rail or a suction cup rail grab bar that you can put in there. Is there some way for someone to hold on when they're using the sink? The next part of the bathroom we need to worry about is the toilet. Again, is the toilet attached to the floor and the wall? Are there grab bars or safety rails on the toilet? We recommend using a 
toilet seat. This is a locking toilet seat that you put right onto your toilet, turn the lock and it holds securely. And in fact, this even has handlebars, has armrests that go on the side that you can use for getting on and off the toilet. Either this or railings or a grab bar is needed near the toilet in order for it to be a safe environment. Again, check to make sure that the bathtub is securely fastened to the floor and the wall. Now, can you get in and out of that tub easily? Try it for yourself. Think of yourself if you're feeling wobbly. Can you get it in and out safely? Again, we recommend the grab bars just as we did for the sink. So you can, you can put a grab bar on the wall. You can even get a tub rail grab bar that you can put on there. Also, when we're talking about entering and exit the tub or the shower, there are specific benches called transfer benches that you can get so that you can easily sit down outside the tub or shower and just slide across and get into position to be able to use it. Remember, water makes for slippery surfaces and makes it easier to fall, which is why we need to also put in non-skid treads. These are inexpensive and a great product to put. And in fact, they won't hurt your floors in any way. They're just so easy to use. These non-skid treads, they come in packs. You put them onto the floor of your tub, onto the floor of your shower. In fact, you can even use these on stairs. They're very easy to apply and they're a great way to reduce fall. Now let's go back to the toilet for a second. People are going to be spending multiple trips to the toilet during the day. So not only do you want to make sure that you have grab bars or a locking toilet seat like we showed you before, but we also want you to be safe when you're cleaning up afterward. So here we have a toilet wand. And there's a variety of these simple devices out there. It just makes it easier to make sure that you're able to reach and to clean up after using the toilet without falling over. Bathroom safety is one of the major areas that you as a caregiver need to make sure happens at, at home. But let's move on to the bedroom. So we need to create a safe place in the bedroom to promote healing. Here's my recommendations for you. When your loved one is not in bed, go in there and turn off the lights. It's your turn to see if you can find your way to the bathroom in the dark. So here are the questions for you. Are there loose rugs on the floor in the bedroom? Can you walk without tripping over anything on the floor, like pet toys, power cords, clothing, anything that could be on the floor? Is there a motion sensor light in the bedroom that easily picks up any kind of movement? Is the bed the correct height for the person? Is there a bed rail in place to grab onto to be able to stand up? Is there a bedside or over the bed table to use in the bedroom? And is there a communication device to be able to call for help if an emergency happens? All of these things are important in order to make the bedroom a safe place to be as you get older. Now there's one other thing that I want to show you about the bedroom that we didn't talk about before. If someone's trying to get out of bed and they're feeling wobbly, we use what is called a transfer belt. A transfer belt is a special belt just made for helping people to be able to stand up. Now think about this. If you've been lying down for eight hours sleeping and you stand up quickly, what can happen? You feel wobbly. You feel uncertain on your feet. A gait belt makes people stable on their feet. So you put this belt around their waist and you see these loops here? This is where you, as the caregiver, can hold on and help them get out of bed. Obviously, this side is what goes around the back. This is what's in the front. So you see, as you're picking them up from the back, 
you have a nice firm hold to help them to get around. There's a difference between a transfer belt and this guy. This is a gate belt. This is just to help someone walk, which is different than helping someone stand up or get down. This is just for holding on to people that are wobbly when they walk. So please don't use this to help someone get out of bed. Now we want to talk about detecting falls. We have voice activated devices like Siri and Hey Google and Alexa that work seamlessly with any smartphone app by saying the right voice command like send help. In fact, most smart watches can detect falls and send for help with even without using a voice command. Keep in mind, none of these devices are going to call 911 and dispatch a health team. There are other devices and services that will answer the cry for help and dispatch the team for a monthly monitoring fee. I have six tips for fall prevention that I want you to follow. First, talk to the doctor about medication side effects. You'll be surprised how many medications actually make people more susceptible to falling. Second, install the grab bars that we talked about, the motion sensor lights, and secure the rugs to the floor. Make sure that walking around is as easy as possible and the supports are there. Next, teach your loved one to stand up slowly to prevent dizziness before taking their first step. This is very important. We're all accustomed to standing and going uh, directly to what we want to do. But as we age and as problems occur, you need to stand slowly and give your body time to adjust before taking off and walking. Please have your loved one do strength and balance exercises. These exercises are the difference between being able to readjust when you're starting to feel wobbly and falling over. One you may not think about is get your hearing and vision checked regularly. Vision and hearing can cause falls. Use a cane or walker if you are feeling wobbly. And lastly, please get a fall assessment. They can identify any specific factors that are increasing your risk of falling and work with you on developing a plan to reduce that risk. Falls can be prevented. Making some lifestyle changes and taking some steps to improve your physical and mental health go a long way. Caregiver stress and burnout is real. 58% of family caregivers report moderate to high burden from this job. Caregivers' health may fail, employment may suffer, income is at risk, retirement savings and Social Security contributions are reduced. Caregivers reduce their work hours, pass up promotions, quit jobs or retire early due to caregiving. Watch out for compassion fatigue. Unlike stress and burnout, compassion fatigue is also called vicarious trauma, which refers to the negative emotions that individuals feel from helping others. Compassion fatigue is rooted in the desire to help. The symptoms of compassion fatigue arise when the desire to help those in pain becomes too great. There is an explosion of compassion fatigue in healthcare workers from the recent pandemic, which is why dependable support and respite care are essential services when you're caring for a person with dementia. Women experience depression at a higher rate than men. About 12 million women experience clinical depression each year, which is twice the rate of men. Physical factors like menopause, childbirth, PMS, thyroid disease, and nutritional deficiencies in iron, vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids can all cause depression. In fact, studies show that women fail to seek treatment due to low self-esteem and personal neglect. 
41% of the women surveyed cited embarrassment or shame as a barrier to getting treatment. Let's dispel this myth that seeking treatment is a sign of weakness. Self-care is not selfish. Men who are caregivers deal with depression differently. Men are less likely to admit depression and doctors are less likely to diagnose depression in men. Men will often self-treat their depressive symptoms of anger, irritability, and feelings of powerlessness with alcohol or overwork. Although male caregivers tend to be more willing than female caregivers to hire outside help for assistance with home care duties, they tend to have fewer friends to confide in or engage in positive activities outside the home. The mistaken assumption that depressive symptoms are a sign of weakness can make it especially difficult for men to seek help. Military and veteran caregivers suffer depression as well. Military and veteran caregivers experience depression nearly twice the rate of non-military caregivers. The more severe the veteran's mental and physical conditions, the higher caregiving stress levels are. Conditions like traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder can be particularly challenging. Trying to cope with these in your own daily life, in addition to watching out for the triggers a veteran has, layers on an additional level of stress. You may feel overwhelmed, helpless, and hopeless, which leads to depression and other emotional manifestations. There are some destructive behaviors I want you to keep an eye on. Do you find yourself crying more? Have your eating habits changed? Sleeping habits? Are you using more tobacco, more alcohol, or other drugs? Do you have problems communicating with other people? Has your sex life changed? And are you socially isolating? Please look out for these problems. So let's talk solutions. The first thing is we need to set some boundaries. There are several ways to carve out more private time in your day. Set boundaries. Communicate your needs and stick to them. Make self-care a priority in your day. Set aside specific blocks of time each day or week for private time. Learn to say no to things that will take away from your private time. Prioritize your tasks and eliminate any unnecessary activities. Remember, private time is important for your mental and emotional well-being. I recommend starting with an open and honest conversation with your loved one about what needs and tasks need to be done. The best approach is to break down specific tasks and, and schedule them out. You become kind of a project manager of care with goals, objectives, and times and dates. It may also be helpful to establish clear boundaries and expectations for the caregiving roles and how you want everyone to communicate and to perform them. Also, I recommend involving family members in creating your care plan for your loved one so that they understand their role and how it contributes to the overall well-being of your loved one. The next step is to set up respite care before you need it. Respite care is a planned break from caregiving. This is a short relief that can be provided by personal family and friends or programs designed for this purpose. Respite care can be provided in a variety of settings. It can be done in your home, in a daycare center, in a residential care facility. It's important to check what options are available in your area and what works best for you and your loved one. There is no wrong door to help. 211 Tampa Bay Cares is a great place to start your search for help. I encourage you to go online or call 211 today. There are significant changes to the care services in our community. 211 knows how and where to connect you because there's no wrong door to care. So, what does that mean for you? It means it empowers you to make informed decisions. You exercise control over your long-term care needs. We want you to succeed with your own personal goals and preferences. 
And no wrong door makes sure that you are connected to a full range of community-based options. There's expanded access to services and support and individuals there to help you navigate the care system. Self-care is caregiving. No one can pour from an empty cup. It's important to remember that taking care of yourself is just as important as caring for another person. It is important to take breaks and to make sure you take care of yourself. So today we've covered why self-care is not selfish. Self-care means taking care of your own health needs, making sure that you don't injure yourself doing your caregiving duties, getting enough sleep, making sure you're looking after your other relationships in your life, making sure that you're not socially isolating yourself or coming on some mental health problems. The best place to start looking for care is 211 Tampa Bay Cares. Call them, go online. The resources are there. Help is just a call away. Thank you.